Hello, how are you tonight? Oh my goodness. Looks like I already have 13 people on here viewing. Oh my goodness. Um, let's see. I think there's a way that I can share. Yes, let me do this. I'm going to share this on Facebook. Okay. I'm going to share it though. Control C on Facebook. Okay. Okay, here we go. So I have a list of things to talk about tonight. And a couple of them are specific questions people have been asking. Some of them are just things that I think that you would like to know and that would benefit you. Um, I'm going to start right out by talking about the difference between superwash and non-superwash wool. Well, there is differences. For example, non-superwash wool, you can felt it. Uh, but you can felt superwash wool too sometimes. So the way they make wool superwash, there's two basic ways that it's done. One is by coating the fibers, the individual fibers, with a type of something that covers up the little scales so that they can't grab a hold of each other. And um, then the other way is to chemically treat it and actually remove the scales. Now, the problem is that when a wool says that it's superwash, you have no idea of knowing which process was used, and they're not going to tell you. So if the chemical process was used where it strips the scales off, that wool can always go through the washer and dryer, and it will never felt. But if you have superwash wool that has had the coating put on it, eventually that coating wears off when you put it in the washer and dryer. And you don't know which time it's going to wear off. So one time you'll take it out of the washer and it will be felted. So I'm not willing to take that chance. What I do is, um, just a second, I want to take this off here. I can't see people's comments at the moment. Why am I not seeing anybody's comments? Okay, hi. I don't see any comments. I don't know how to see them this evening. Usually I see them for free. Um, anyway, so I wash all my wool by hand. And fortunately, my children were around me enough that they understand that they have to wash their wool things by hand. I knit them lots of things. And if they, pardon me? Yeah, or, or my kids give them back to me to wash because they know I'll wash them. It's no big deal. You know, like, for example, hand knit socks, wool socks. I wear them several times before I wash them. Sometimes I wear them 10 or 15 or 20 times before I wash them because, amazingly enough, the wool doesn't absorb odors from your feet. And when you wear wool socks, your feet don't stink. They don't sweat. Um, there isn't. The, uh, somebody asked if about which yarns use the coating versus which ones use the chemical process. They don't tell you, and there's no way to find out. Um, it's a crapshoot. It's like playing Russian roulette. So I just wash everything by hand. And it's no big deal. You get used to it. Um, and after I put all that much work into it, I don't want it to felt. Things have gotten accidentally felted. I knit a really cute little a hoodie for my granddaughter when she was about one year old out of silk and wool. And it did really good for a long time. Then it accidentally got put in the washer and it became a teddy bear hoodie. But you can always do that. So, um, but my kids are really pretty good. And my husband, I have everybody trained. When I put that much work into something, I want it to stay nice. Superwash blocks almost as well. There's very little difference. I did a test one time where I knitted three swatches out of superwash wool, pretty large swatches. They're about eight by eight. I knit three of them exactly the same, same number of stitches, same number of rows, same needles, and I did them sequentially so it was about in the same amount of time, so they're the same gauge. One of them I did nothing to. 
The second one, I blocked it in my normal fashion. I soaked it in water for at least 20 minutes, and then I laid it out and pinned it so it was flat without stretching it. Just pinned it flat so that the edges weren't curled. The third one, I soaked for at least 20 minutes. I took it out and I stretched it as far as it would go in every direction and pinned it, and I let those dry. When I took the pins out on the one that I had stretched, it was larger than the non-stretched one on each, in each direction. But amazingly, after about three weeks of just sitting there, it actually reduced back down to the exact same size as the other one. And that was super washable. What this tells me is that for those who knit a sweater, and their sweater turns out a little bit too small, and they think, well, they can just block it to fit. Sure, you can block it to fit, and it might fit for about a week, but then it's gonna go back to the size that it wants to be, and it'll be too small. So the smartest thing to do, of course, and that's what we've been working on, is swatching, and making a big enough swatch. If you make a little itty bitty swatch, it's gonna lie to you every time, and you'll be disappointed. Um, and, and that brings me to the topic of why is gauge given in four by four inches? Isn't that an answer? Why? Well, the only thing I can think of is that, you know, knitting was happening in Europe for many, many hundreds of years before we started knitting in the United States. And they used the metric system. And of course, they use meters and millimeters and centimeters. So 10 centimeters is four inches. So it really started with 10 centimeters. 10 centimeters is easy to measure. It's a round, nice, easy number to make calculations with. And then it got transferred to us and 10, since 10 centimeters is equal to four inches, we took over with the four inches, which is kind of a crazy number. I mean, why four inches? So then people think they need to knit their swatch four inches that a gauge swatch should be four inches, but that's not true. Your gauge swatch needs to be as big as it needs to be to give you an accurate number. And I usually use like a six to eight inch wide gauge swatch and at least three or four inches long. It does not have to be really long because it, uh, the stitch gauge is far more important than row gauge. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. I have my list down here, see? I have questions people have been asking, so I'm gonna try to answer all of these. So the superwash versus non-superwash, we got that cleared up, I think. I use both of them equally. I like non-superwash wool, too. Um, non-superwash is really much nicer for shawls that are going to be stretched, lace that's going to be stretched. If you use superwash wool for lace and shawls that need to be stretched, they will stretch out and be absolutely beautiful. But in a couple of weeks, they will get smaller and they won't be quite as beautiful as they are when they're really stretched. So if you're going to make an heirloom piece like a wedding veil or a wedding shawl that's going to be lace or you're going to be doing some um, a Northern European lace styles, the Russian lace and stuff like that, you want to use non-superwash wool because when you stretch it, it will stay stretched. It won't, it won't pull back in like the superwash does. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about stitch gauge and row gauge. This is a really interesting phenomenon. Let me see, I've got something here. So what happens, a lot of times people will say, well, I used a five needle and a six needle and a seven. And on the five and the six, I have a different row gauge, but I have the same stitch gauge. So how would that happen? Well, let me show you, I need some yarn. I need some scissors. Hold on just a second here. This is the little, this is the wool that I used for the example for um, repurposing your swatch yarn. I'm gonna use a piece of this. I'm gonna show you something that's very interesting and that will explain that phenomenon. So it's called wraps per inch. Have you ever heard of wraps per inch? So if you take a ruler, here's a ruler and you wrap the yarn around the ruler. And you squish it up, you slide the wraps up to each other. So here's a bunch of wraps, can you see those? And I've slid them till they're right up next, they won't go any closer together. So what happens is, I'm gonna put some more on here so you can see it better. 
See them? They only go so close together. It, the only way you can get them closer together is if they pile on top of each other, which they're, you don't want them to do. So in knitting for your stitches, the stitches can only get so small. You can continue going down in needle size, but the stitches won't get smaller. But what will happen is that the row gauge will get tighter. So what has happened for people that say, well, I used a five, six, and a seven, and on the five and six, I got the same stitch gauge, but I got a different row gauge. They're going down to the smallest needle that that wool can handle. For example, if you used worsted weight wool and you used a US-1 needle, you're still going to get like five stitches to the inch because that wool can't squish any tighter together. But you'll get a lot more rows per inch. So that's where row gauge and stitch gauge kind of have their uh, intersection. You need to get up to the needle size where the row gauge and the stitch gauge both change together. Um, I hope that makes sense. Does anybody have a question about that? No? Okay. So this, um, I think that we're pretty close to real time here. So when you uh, want to ask a question, just pop it out there, type it in, and I'll answer it for you. So now let's talk, that leads me to talk about yarn balls and winding your yarn balls. So when you wind a ball by hand, you might use your thumb as the center if you're making a center pull ball, or you may not, you have anything in the center and you make a ball that you're gonna pull from the outside. But when you wind a ball by hand, there's no space in the middle for to absorb some of the extra yarn and allow it to maintain its normal length and without being stretched. But if you use a ball winder that has a cone on the center and you wind the ball on the ball winder, when you take it off, that center collapses in and it allows the yarn to relax. So when you're winding a ball by hand, yes, it's very important to not wind it too tight because the yarn will stay straight, it can't relax. But when you're using a ball winder, it's okay to wind the ball tight because when you take it off of the cone, it can collapse in the center and retain its normal length. And then you pull from the center of the ball. Personally, I prefer my balls, uh, yarn balls to have tighter. They stay together better. They don't fall apart. I get less tangles, but it's personal preference. You can do whatever you want, but I did want to explain that difference. Okay. Then we'll talk about when I teach classes uh, locally, I teach in my beginning knitting class, I have everybody use the exact same yarn, the same needles. In fact, I provide it in a kit. So we all have the same yarn and the same needles. The only variable is the knitter. And we knit these specific swatches and then we do gauge on them. And it's very interesting because you can get a wide variety of stitch and row gauge from people using the same needles and same yarn. So this is why when you're reading a pattern and they suggest a stitch gauge and they set, suggest a needle size, the needle, it should always say a US blank blank needle or millimeter needle or size needed to obtain gauge. You can't just assume that you're going to have the exact same gauge as the person who designed the garment or who knitted the garment. Everyone's gauge might be different. When I first was uh, learning, <laughs> learning how to knit, but when I was first knitting, I had a very low knitting budget, a minimal, nothing. And so I had a pair of US 10 needles and I would only knit things that said that you needed a US 10 needle because I couldn't afford to buy another pair of needles if I wanted to buy yarn. I could either buy yarn, inexpensive yarn, or I could buy needles, but I couldn't buy both. So I stuck with my US 10 needles for a long time and everything I knit was on the 10 needles. Suffice to say, I have a lot of needles now, so I can use any size I want, multiples of the same sizes, so. Um, you, you could do that. It's okay. So, so the question is, if you have a ball of yarn, can you knit one mitten from the inside and one mitten from the outside? Yes, you can. 
especially if you just wound that ball. Now, that's another thing I, I didn't mention, but normally I don't wind my yarn into balls until I'm ready to knit, for example, even on a sweater. Um, in fact, one of the videos that I'm going to do coming up in this coming week is I'm going to show you how to use hand dyed yarns and how to blend them because you're going to have to work with two skeins at a time throughout the sweater uh, so that you don't end up with lines or big blocks of colors. Um, but I wind my yarn right before I use it, even if it's a sweater. I don't wind all the balls at one time. In fact, I don't have the yarn store wind my balls. I buy the yarn in the skeins, I bring them home, and I wind them when I'm ready to use them. Of course, then I have to have a swift and a ball winder, but I knit enough that, that I need to have those at home. So yes, if you had just wound the ball, you can knit from the inside and the outside at the same time. If that ball has been sitting there and it's been really, really tight for a long time, I would just reskein it and then wind it back into a ball again, and then you can knit from the inside and the outside. That should work. So the next thing on my list is, you know, this knit along that we're doing is this sweater. And I'm going to be teaching you a lot of things. I hope you've seen the list of things that you're going to learn. It's You're going to be amazed. But we're going to learn them one baby step at a time. Because if I got you going on the whole thing all at once, you would back out because it would blow your mind. You would be afraid to start. You'd say, I'm not good enough. But we're going to do it baby steps, one step at a time. Everybody's good enough. You're all going to have a wonderful sweater when you finish. But in the meantime... I would like you to communicate about your sweater if you have questions in my Ravelry group. And I'll put a link to that after this video is done. It'll be down in the description of the video. But it's Knitting with Suzanne Bryan on Ravelry. And I have moderators on there and they communicate with me. I would really prefer that you communicate through Ravelry. And that way, if they think that something needs to be brought to my attention uh, quickly, they will notify me. Otherwise, I get so many messages on Ravelry. I get so many emails. I get so many messages on Facebook that every morning it takes me an hour or two to go through them all. Um, I love answering people's questions, but I would really like if, if you post on Ravelry, then everyone can, and it'll help a lot of other people too. So those are my parameters. So, and also in the Ravelry group, you may find the answer to your question because someone else probably already asked it. So that's, that's that. So um, someone asked, if you plan on losing a lot of weight, how do you know what size sweater to knit? Now, that's a hard question to answer. First of all, many people who plan on losing weight, unfortunately don't or they do and gain it back. Um, but if you're the kind of person who you're having bariatric surgery or you're having something done and you know you're gonna lose a lot of weight or you're on some special medical diet or something and you are going to lose weight, then the answer to that question is, is what weight and how big do you think your chest circumference, how much do you think it's going to change? What I would do, just so that you don't end up with a sweater that's too small because you didn't lose the weight, is I would give yourself extra ease. So let's say that you're at a 48 inch bust and you want to go down to a 40 inch bust. What I would do is, if your bust is 40 inches, I would knit a sweater that has maybe six to eight inches of ease. Um, normally for myself, I use about four inches of ease. So six to eight inches isn't all that much. In fact, if you take out and you pull out some of your fabric here to the side, like that, I'm pulling that out about two inches. So that's four inches of ease right there. So if I just pulled it out three inches, that's six inches of ease. It isn't all that much fabric. Uh, so it would be a little bit, have more ease on you if you lost all the weight you want to lose, but it would still fit you if you didn't lose as much as you wanted to. Uh, for the people who have, you know, gain weight, lose weight, gain weight, lose weight. I would knit it to your current weight. I think that's the best thing to do because you're going to invest a lot of time in this sweater. And uh, the type of sweater we're knitting, it's a cardigan. It's meant to be worn over other clothing. It can be a little bit bulkier and it will still look really nice on you. It'll be absolutely gorgeous. Let's see. Um, another person asked, 
you know, how I recommend knitting your gauge swatch and then carrying it around with you and looking at it and getting it out and feeling it and touching it for a week or so before you actually take your gauge. Someone asked, well, how do you carry it around with you? If you stick it in your purse, it might get damaged or poked or get a hole pulled in it. Um, I carry my knitting bag around with me. In fact, my knitting bag is my purse. I carry my knitting bag and put my wallet in it. Uh, but for those who carry a purse, maybe you have an outside pocket or something where you can stick the swatch, but you still need to get it out and move it, stretch it, play with it. Don't just leave it in your purse. That's not enough. Or if you don't want to carry it around with you, have it at home, have it near the chair that you sit in when you're relaxing so that you can get it out, pull on it, stretch it, manipulate it, move it, play with it, and allow it to, to um, take its natural shape. Another question is these live streams that I'm doing for like right now, this is 7.30 or I started at 7.30 at night here in California. On the East Coast, that's 10.30. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Um, I could do it earlier in the evening. I could do maybe, I don't know, maybe 6.30 or 6 o'clock. Would that be too much? Um, you can leave comments after this. After this is over. You can still comment on this video. Leave me comments on what would be a good time. And if Sunday night's not good, tell me. You know, I want to be able to catch people that work as well as people that don't work. So if I did it in the middle of the week, in the middle of the day, all those people that work wouldn't be able to participate. Um, I could do it um, Sunday morning. I could do it Saturday morning. I think the weekend might be better. Maybe Saturday morning would be good. But let me know. Give me feedback on that because I want to do it when it works best for you. This isn't about me. It's about you. I want you to learn how to knit this sweater. Uh, does anybody else have any other questions? So what's coming up this week? On Wednesday, I'm making a video on how to measure yourself. I have a male model and a female model, and we're going to uh, show how to measure, because this is a unisex cardigan. It will look equally well on men as women. In fact, I'll have the male uh, model my sweater so you can see what it looks like. But I'm making a video on how to take proper body measurements. And then I'm also making a um, form that you can fill out to mark off your measurements on it, and you'll get that uh, about the same time that I make the video, I'll send that out to all the people that have purchased the pattern. And by the way, right now, about 500 people have purchased this pattern. So that's pretty amazing. And I thank you all. That is so, so awesome. I was flabbergasted. Um, any other questions? Anything anybody wants to talk about? I will be posting on Ravelry. There's a thread on there that we just put up today that if you have specific questions that you want me to address, um, just put them in there and I'll, the next time I do my live streaming, I'll answer your questions. Okay, when row gauge does, when row gauge does count, when row gauge is important is if you're doing something that has interval stranded knitting, mosaic knitting, uh, anything, intarsia, anything with a design that needs to fit in a certain space, that is when row gauge is extremely important. Otherwise, row gauge isn't so important. Now I have seen people talk about um, like raglan. So we're gonna be doing raglans. And you know, usually you do your increases or decreases. Top down, it's gonna be increases. Bottom up, it's decreases every other row. So what you need to do is find that needle size. If you're, like I talked about before, if you have two needle sizes that give you the same stitch gauge, but a different row gauge, don't use the smaller one. Go up with the one that's a little bit larger because that's going to be your accurate row and stitch gauge. So basically in the doing, row gauge isn't really important. I wouldn't fuss about it. I'd try to get your stitch gauge because um, we're going to be, figuring out how much yarn you need from your sweater by your stitch gauge. So the next steps we actually need to do to calculate yarn is we're going to take our measurements and then we're gonna draw a schematic and that will be another video right after the measurement one will be how to draw a schematic, your schematic, and you can use this schematic forever. 
Once you have your schematic, your personal schematic, you can use it over and over. We're going to make a schematic for this sweater. And that, that will be your guide. This is, somebody asked, is this knit along good for someone who's never knit a sweater before? Yes, this is the perfect one. Because I'm going to tell you every little thing to do. For people who've knit lots of sweaters, they'll have a few aha moments. They'll go, oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. But they'll, some of it they'll know. A lot of it they'll know. That's, so someone asked, they just started knitting this year and they don't know where to count stitches. Did you watch the um, making a, a gauge swatch video? Okay, the gauge swatch video shows you how to knit stitches. I also have some videos and I'll link them to this live stream after it's over on how to, on how to read your knitting. Um, so I have videos on reading your knitting, and that will help you. I also have a blog post on how to read your knitting. It will help you immensely. One of the things that is a foundation thing to know in knitting is how to read your knitting. And you would be amazed. I have seen people who've been knitting for 30, 40, 50 years who do not know how to read their knitting. These people take uh, my, my knitting classes here in Bakersfield. I, the first one, which is beginning knitting, I call it boot camp one. The second one after that's boot camp two, and I require everyone to take boot camp one before they take any other classes from me. And even if they've been knitting their entire lives and they still go, whoa, I did not know that. They learn so many things and their knitting improves so much and they learn how to read their knitting. I, I teach reading your knitting right from the very beginning. And many of my videos, if you watch my videos, I show you exactly the stitches in there about reading your knitting. Any other questions? Yes, and tips is, so this person is asking, they are training themselves to knit, changing from English to continental for speed, which you can knit really, I am a continental knitter. I, I knit English and continental, but my choice is continental. Um, and you can knit much, much, much faster. I have a video and I'll link this one at the end also, it's called Even Tension. And it shows you how to knit on the tips of your needles. That's the key is knitting on the tips of your needles and with no wasted movements. And it makes very even stitches, very even tension, and you can do it very quickly. So I'll link that one. Let me, I gotta write this down. Which ones do I need to link? I need to link um, even tension and reading your knitting and the swatch. Yes. Now, the best way, somebody asked um, how you'll know when the videos come out. So, you know, I can't see any of your questions because for some reason I'm not seeing them on my screen. But what I have is I have hearing aids. I wear hearing aids because I'm really hard of hearing. And I have my daughter. <laughs> she's actually watching this live over at her house. And she's on the telephone with me. And so when people ask a question, she gives me your question. Isn't that nice of her? Her name's Sarah. I love my daughter. Um, anyway, so the question is, how will you know when new videos come out? Well, first of all, if you subscribe to my YouTube channel and you have your notifications set so that you'll be emailed when a new video comes out, you'll get an email every time. Uh, the other way is in my Facebook group, Knitting with Suzanne Bryan on Facebook. I always post a link to every new video. Also in my Ravelry group, Knitting with Suzanne Bryan, I post a link to every video. With the day they come out, right after they come out, I post the links on there. So if you join one of those groups, subscribe to my YouTube channel, which is what I really prefer. To tell you the truth, the biggest weight that YouTube puts on uh, someone like me who, who uh, is a... Um, what would I call myself? Videographer, I guess. Um, 
is how many people subscribe to your channel. It's not how many people view your work, it's how many people subscribe to your channel. So by subscribing to my channel, you're giving me credit on YouTube, and I would appreciate that, plus sharing my videos, and giving me a thumbs up, and leaving comments, I like all that stuff. Because I'm doing this, I'm doing this out of the goodness of my heart to help you knit. <laughs> Okay, so my, my daughter said to tell Judy hi, but she can't comment because she actually doesn't have a daughter, doesn't even have a YouTube account, so she can't even subscribe to my YouTube channel. Isn't that amazing? I'm going to have to do something about that, don't you think? <laughs> Um, actually, the raglan and the yoke are so close together, and that's something that I can address. Yes. Um, if you make a schematic for the raglan, you can use it for a yoke, and I'll tell you how um, when we do that. But you can't use it for drop shoulder. You can't use it for set-in sleeves. Those are other sweaters that we can do after this one if people are interested. If enough people like what we're doing this time, like maybe after Christmas, I will do another sweater knit along and we can do either set in sleeves or drop shoulders. We can do a different one or we could even do um, a yoke. But uh, basically the yoke and the raglan are tightly related and I'll explain that uh, in a video coming up. Any other questions? You guys are doing some, you're, you're giving me good questions. I like it. Okay, so I'm going to say good night and um, join one of my groups, you know, if you want to keep up with what's going on. You don't even have to do this sweater. You know, you can look at all these videos and you can watch my live streams if you don't, you know, you don't have to buy the knit along and do that if you don't want to. You can just watch the videos. But if you do buy the knit along, then you're going to get all the written materials that will go out to the people because I, I have all the directions written down and. Um, it's not just video related. This is just support materials for the written materials. This is. You could use Red Heart. Someone asked if you could use, do you have to use a specific kind of yarn? No, you can use any yarn you want. Any yarn. As long as it's between fingering and bulky. I don't want to teach for lace weight. I don't think that's appropriate for a cardigan or super bulky. I'm not going to teach you about making a cardigan with super bulky, but you can choose yarn any any in between. Watch my gauge swatch video and make your gauge swatch. Join my Ravelry group. Post your swatches in there so we can talk about them. And then we'll do the schematic. Then between your gauge swatch and the schematic, I'll show you how to calculate how much yarn you're going to need. Now, for those who want to buy a sweater's worth of quantity of yarn right now, we are using the In Ann Bud's book, handy book, handy, uh, Knitter's Handy Book of Top Down Sweaters. You can look up the chest circumference of your finished sweater that you want to have and your stitch gauge, and it will give you a ballpark figure about how much yarn you need to uh, use. And you probably need to have at least another 200 yards uh, beyond what she says so that you can do the shawl collar and the pockets because that will take extra yarn and you're going to be knitting swatches and there's going to be cables my daughter is screening through your questions right now so Yes, uh, someone asked if they could make separate swatches, not all together. Certainly, you can make, uh, and but mark them like I show you, put the little pearl bumps on so you can remember which needle size. That's the biggest thing, mistake I make is not uh, notating on the swatch which needle size I used. And then later on, I go back to that swatch and I have no idea what size needles I used. So put those little pearl bumps there. Um, if you're using the metric system, like let's say you're using a 3.5 millimeter needle, you can put three pearl bumps, a knit, and then two pearl bumps for a 3.5, or if it's 3.25, you could put three pearl bumps, a knit, and then one pearl bump, so it's three point and a quarter, three and a quarter, like that. Um, that'll help you remember the size. 
It can, it can be in between. For example, let's say you're getting three and a half stitches to the inch. So yes, yeah, so I forgot to ask the question. The question is, does your gauge have to fit with the ones in Ann Bud's book? No, because she just has whole numbers. She has three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like that. Um, if you're getting three and a half stitches to the inch or five and a half stitches to the inch, what you would do is take between, if you're getting five and a half, you would use uh, the five and a half and the six, average them, and then, uh, you know, add them together and, and uh, divide in half and use that. Does that, does that? You can use circular needles, but the sweater's not knit in the round. The sweater's knit flat. I use circular circular needles for just about everything. So um, you can use any kind of needles you want. It doesn't matter. But the most important thing is whatever needles you use for your gauge swatch, those needs to be the same needles you use for your sweater. Not just the size, but the same exact needles. Because let's say you're using a Haya Haya needle for your gauge swatch, and then you use a Chagu needle for your sweater. Believe me, you won't get the same gauge. They have a slight. Someone wanted to know how much to uh, how much to figure for extra for the cables. Not that much. The cables are going to take some extra, but Anne has enough built in there extra that it would be okay. Um, maybe one. But between the cables, the pockets, the shawl collar, I would get two hundred yards. Either you know one extra skein of worsted weight yarn. Uh, if you're using bulky, you might need to get two skeins. Yes, yep. Now, another thing is, oh yes, <laughs> somebody asked, <laughs> my daughter is correcting me. We make a good team. Um, somebody asked, so seven stitches to the inch would be the tightest that you would want to get. And the answer is yes. Uh, fingering weight yarn, you can get seven stitches to the inch. But again, go back and watch that gauge swatch video because I talked about the fabric. If you're using fingering weight yarn, you'll probably want to do, I would do like a three, uh, a two, three, and four needle. Um, oftentimes, if it's not a cardigan with fingering weight yarn, I might use a five needle, but that's a more a stretchy fabric and something that's going to breathe more. The cardigan, you want to have a little bit more firmness to the fabric so it doesn't lose its shape and get stretched out of shape. Uh, so fingering weight yarn, you might want to try a two, three, and four and see which one of those fabrics you like best. Does that answer you? I use 24-inch cables for everything. <laughs> Somebody asked what length cable works. I use 24-inch for everything. Very rarely do I need to use one that's longer. And I'm one of those people that use two circulars for knitting in the round rather than magic loop. But a lot of people use magic loop. So if you like magic loop, you'll have longer cables. It's okay. I wouldn't use a 16 inch or anything like that. 24 inch or longer, it will be fine. When we get to the sleeves, we'll be knitting in the round. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Because you'll probably have difference in your, in your stitch gauge when you change from knitting flat to knitting in the round. And we'll talk about how to check for that and how to compensate for it. A store sweater you like the fit of. Uh, somebody asked that somebody said, I mentioned earlier about trying sweaters on in the store and finding one that you like the fit and then measuring it. You want to measure that sweater. I and and you can ask my daughter, we do this all the time. <laughs> I find really cute sweaters at the store and we go and we try them on and then I lay them down on the floor and I take pictures and, and I measure them. <laughs> because then I know that's going to fit the e that we like the ease of that sweater. Or you may have something in your closet that you like. Try the clothing on in your, in your closet, but it needs to be about the same weight as the yarn that you want to knit with. For example, if you go to a store and try on a bulky sweater, but you're gonna knit it in fingering weight, that won't work. You need to try on a sweater that's about in fingering weight or equivalent. And vice versa, if you're going to knit it in bulky weight, you can't go to the store and try on a lightweight sweater and get good measurements because the bulky weight takes a whole lot more space and you'll need more ease than you do with a fingering weight. The <laughs> you're going to have a book by the time you're done. 
what I do in my live classes here in Bakersfield is I just give you out the information that you need at that time because I want to teach you. I like to teach knitting and I teach you the theory and the concepts. If I give you all the information up front, guess what? You're going to knit it and you'll be done before I've done any of the teaching and you won't have learned anything. You've just knitted another sweater. What I want you to do is knit a perfect sweater for yourself. And I'm going to teach you how to do that. And But it, as I said before, it's baby steps. I'll give you out the information as you need it. And we're going to do the, schemat the measuring our bodies and schematics next on October 4th. We'll be ready to start knitting. And so at that, that time, I'm going to have information about what type of cast on is best to use for the neck of a cardigan, because that's where we're going to start is the back neck. Um, and we'll talk about uh, compensating for cable flare because we're going to start a cable right away. We'll talk about how wide should your cable be. We'll swatch for our cables. Uh, there's still more homework to do before we actually start our sweater. Okay. It doesn't really matter. It's the, the chest tight, how it fits around here that you want to look at. How much space is it around the bust? That's what you want to measure. The question was, what if the store-bought sweater isn't the same construction? Like if it's a, a drop shoulder or set in sleeves versus raglan. Or four is how it fits around the bust. And then lay it on the floor and just measure the width across the bust and multiply that by two. And that gives you the chest circumference of the finished sweater. Okay, my daughter says there's no more questions. I hope you enjoy doing this. I hope you come back and uh, listen to some more of this and watch my videos. And I'll see you next time. Happy knitting.